out of curiosity, how many of you were not here last night? This morning's your first session. Okay, Scott, you want to look around? Two, four, six, eight, about eight, uh, eight people that weren't here. Uh, some of those who were here last night told us they wouldn't be able to make it today, and others are just running late, I think. And so uh, we're, we're going to go ahead and get started so as not to squeeze uh, time this morning with Scott and what he wants to get done. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did last night and that you're learning and that we're moving forward. It is uh, exciting times. And uh, those who had plans for today, they're going to be rained out. They should have just come on, huh, and uh, been here because it's going to be mighty sunny inside and we're going to have a good time and a time of refreshing. We are so glad that you're here. If you weren't here last night and you didn't get a workbook, there are workbooks right back here on the table in front of the uh, in front of the camera. There, uh, we are uh, filming these so that they can be viewed later on. Uh, they'll be edited and put on online so that you can go back and you can review and uh, see, see if you missed anything, you ought to be able to pick that up. So those of you who this morning's the first time, once those get posted, Scott will have, or uh, Mark will have it where you can look at and choose which session, and you can take your workbook and fill out that at that time. Uh, Mark, when are you going to have those ready? A week or so? Okay, and then you can go on and you can use your workbook and get to it. Okay, let's pray, and uh, then we'll have Scott go ahead and come up, and we'll get started this morning. Father God, we thank you for the light of a new day, for the rest that you gave us this last night. We pray that today our hearts and our minds will be sharp, that we might receive and welcome the words that you have for us. We thank you that the Holy Spirit is our teacher and that uh, you use different mouthpieces, and we thank you for how you have used Scott and how you're going to use him today. And we just pray that we would be open to receive what you have for us today. Once again, we love you. We pray that you would be honored in the time that we spend together today. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Good morning. It is great to be back with you again this morning as we ask God to revive us again. Uh, and for those of you who are joining us for the first time, welcome. Last night, uh, we looked, first of all, uh, we, we wanted to see how God worked with those two disciples walking on the Emmaus Road. And we remembered that sometimes Jesus is working when we can't see it and when we can't feel it. But that doesn't mean He's not working. And He's working in us. And Jesus wants to grow in our... Let's all dance to the music, everybody. That's good. No worries. No worries. That's Jesus calling, maybe. Who knows? All right. <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. It's no worries. But uh, we looked at Jesus walking with those two disciples on the Emmaus Road. Remember, what did they say about Jesus' teaching after He disappeared? They said, didn't our what? Our hearts burn within us. We talked about that being an image of revival that... We want our hearts to burn within us when we get into God's Word. And then we took some time last night and looked at the life of Peter. And we looked at him being called. And we could obviously, we could have stayed all night to look at all the Scripture that describes Peter's life. But we looked at some snapshots in his life from when he was saved and then some of the uh, missteps he made in his walk with Jesus. And you know, one thing that's wonderful about Scripture is it shows the warts. It shows the scars that people has, it, and 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 it, there's no other than J Jesus is the hero of the Bible, but uh, all the other human beings are fallible. They're saved sinners. You know, when we get to heaven and meet people in that hall of faith, every one of them are going to say, "Don't worship me, worship Jesus." You know, you think about Mary; she's going to be saying, "Don't worship me, <laughs> worship Jesus," because He is the one who is God. But in Scripture, we see people's mistakes and we see Peter's journey of growth. And then when you read First and Second Peter, it, um, I want to encourage you from here on out, you know, as you read First and Second Peter, think about him having had all of those experiences and having grown. And then he's encouraging us to follow Jesus as he has learned. And we're all on those journeys. And sometimes we go through trials, don't we? And James says, count it all what? You know that verse, count it all joy when you encounter various trials because God is perfecting our faith in this life. 
Uh, and so revival is not just a meeting that we schedule. The reason we've set apart time for this weekend, and thank you for being here on a rainy Saturday morning, but the reason we're here is not to be able to wear a pen that says we studied the Bible this morning, although I'm glad we get to do that. We're here seeking revival as a state of being. Revival comes when we fall in love with Jesus again in a new and in a fresh way. And as followers of Jesus, many, many times in our journey from salvation to being with Jesus forever and ever in His physical presence, we need revival over and over and over again. A young pastor asked an older pastor, how old are you? do you need to be before you don't need revival anymore? And this pastor in his 80s said, you'll have to ask a man older than me. I need Jesus to revive me today. So that's what we're asking God to do. And, and, and again, too, let's not overcomplicate it. Let's keep it simple. God's Word is simple. And we want to just look at His Word and let Him speak to us. Last night, through the lives of those two disciples and Peter, we did some self-examination. And how many of you got to know something about somebody you didn't know about before last night around the table? I talked to four different tables and they said they got to talk to people last night that they'd never really gotten beyond hello with before on Sunday. And so I think that's what revival also looks like when God grows our quantania, our love for one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. And so I hope that that's a, a byproduct of this weekend. But we want to be more in love with Jesus. We want to be more loving to one another. And then we're advancing the gospel together. Has our society changed a little bit? Yes. I just think about uh, Brother Tommy preaching the Culture War series in the early 1990s as I was a boy going into middle school and then going through high school. And just think about many of the things that you used God's Word to warn us about we're now seeing in front of our eyes. But at the same time, there is a door of opportunity to reach people with Jesus like we've not experienced. Uh, when I go around Illinois, I'm finding spiritual hunger everywhere. Everywhere. Thousands upon thousands. Just think about 8 million people in Chicago alone that need Jesus. And they've gone down these dead-end streets and they're finding out that it's a dead-end street. And, and what we're called to do is even though the society has changed, we're not supposed to withdraw into a, a, almost like putting a moat around the church and, and keeping people out and trying to brace ourselves. God doesn't call us to live like that. In this season, we're to be out sharing and out inviting. And so when we're revived, we realize that. That we realize that yes, things have changed, but there's a wonderful door of opportunity and God can bring an awakening to our land through the revival of His church. And we fall in love with Him again. That leads to an awakening. So last night we did some personal self-examination. As we move into today, we're still looking personally within ourselves, but I also want us to look corporately as a church a little bit. We're gonna, you're going to see that move. And this morning, first of all, we're going to look at the church in Ephesus. We're going to look at Jesus' message to that church and, and hear His message to us as well that we can apply in it. And then after that, I want to talk a little bit about the times in which we're living because one of the big parts that helped me form my biblical worldview as a young man at Towering Oaks was Brother Tommy taught Bible prophecy and showed us. Now, it wasn't all that he taught because the, we shouldn't just learn it for the facts, right, Brother Tommy? We do it because God wants us to be pure and productive for Him as we're following Him. So we're going to look at a little bit of that so we can remember where we are because I think when we remember where we are and where we're going, that also can bring revival because we have clarity about where we are and we remember where we are going. Um, you know, my dad, uh, Harold Foshi, went home to be with the Lord last year. That was a very clarifying event in my life. And now I have his principles. And, his, uh, I, and you know what? I don't, he is not lost. We, Mom and I know exactly where he is this morning. And, and when I know where he is, and I also know he's waiting on me, but he's not, uh, uh, Levi, my son, asked, he said, do you think daddy misses us, or grandpa misses us in heaven? Papa misses us? I said, no. I said, there were times when we would go on vacation sometimes and we'd drive down from Illinois and mom and dad would have to come a little bit later because daddy was working. And I said, you remember how we felt when we were waiting to see mom and dad's car pull in? I said, maybe that's how dad is. He knows we're coming. Um, but when I know where I'm going, that gives me clarity and it helps me, it helps me stay away from sin. It helps me keep my eyes focused on Jesus. So that's what we're going to do this morning. And then this afternoon, 
We're going to get into the book of Nehemiah a little bit. And we want to see his healthy burden that he had to see Israel turn back to the Lord. And we need that burden. And, and so, in other words, we're going to ask God, what does revival look like at Towering Oaks this afternoon? That's an exciting question to ask, isn't it? And let him begin speaking to us. And around the table, you're going to listen to God together. And I, I pray that he's going to give you some vision today for what that looks like. But let's pray, and then we're going to get into the book of Revelation, and we're going to be in Revelation chapter 2. Father, thank You for bringing us together again. Thank You for Towering Oaks. Thank You that we can serve You together. Um, Lord, I just pray that You would speak to our hearts. Remove distractions in our minds. Uh, we set ourselves apart for You, and we ask You, Lord, we beg You, revive us. Help us to fall in love with You. May Your Word change our lives. We want to be more like You. We want to reach people with Your love. And it's in Jesus' name, everybody said. Amen. 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 Look in your notebook. It's on page 11. And if you missed last night and you would like to get a copy of the blanks filled in, now Mark's going to have those videos coming pretty soon, but I'll be glad to get you that information today during one of our breaks. We'll make sure you get those if you'd like to have those. Um, look at just verses 4 and 5 at what Jesus says to this church at Ephesus. And we're going to look through the whole church, but let's look at the... I just want to ask you this question as we begin this morning. Have you left your first love? This church of Ephesus would be, uh, on the outside, a very fruitful church. Uh, in Illinois, we have a newspaper called the Illinois Baptist. So when I talk about the church of Ephesus in a lot of our churches, this church probably would have had a story in the Illinois Baptist about their vacation Bible school or about their mission trips, or about different things they were doing. So on the outside, it looked great. But Jesus sees our hearts, doesn't He? And He was warning this church that even though everything looked great on the outside, He was concerned about this in their hearts. He says, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. And then in verse 5, remember this church is vibrant on the outside. It has a lot of fruit, so to anyone's human eyes, they would have been really impressed with what the church was doing. But Jesus gives them a warning. He says, remember from where you have fallen and repent. What does the word repent mean? We turn away from our sin and ourself and we turn to Jesus. We turn to Jesus. We turn back to Jesus. And He says, do the deed you did at first. In other words, remember your salvation. Remember what I did for you. Remember the purity of being devoted to Jesus. Remember what we looked at, what Peter said? He said, like newborn babies crave the pure milk of God's Word. That's a picture of revival. When our lives get overly complicated, many times it's because we've woven a web of sin and we're living double lives. We're compartmentalizing, compartmentalizing I can't say that word this morning, compartmentalizing, there it goes, our lives. And... It gets complicated. Don't you think that's one of the reasons we have such anxiety in our society? Depression? All these issues? It's because we've made it too complicated. If we'll just return like newborn babies to the pure milk of God's Word and living by His Word and let God wash that slate clean. And that's what this vision is. He says, he says repent and do the deed you did at first or else... What does, what does Jesus say He's going to do to this church? He's going to close the church. He's going to take the lampstand out. Now, that doesn't mean Jesus is closing the big C church. He'll raise up another group of believers that are going to follow Him. But He's going to remove their lampstand unless you repent. That is a personal message from Jesus to us. It's to Ephesus, but it's recorded in God's Word for us. So this is for Towering Oaks. This is for Scott Foshi and his family in Chatham Baptist Church. That's where we're members at. It's, it's a message for all of us that we need to fall in love with Jesus again. Look at your notes. The church age had begun when Jesus sent this letter to Ephesus. We're living in the church age today. And the church age is a time in history when God is extending His grace to the world through His church. Do we deserve to be saved the only thing that Scott Foshi earned is hell. <laughs> but when I was nine years old and I asked Jesus to forgive me of my sin, He took away that eternal punishment I deserve and I began a journey with Him that we're all still on if you know Jesus. And um, we're in this church age. 
And we're, we're, we're blessed to be saved, but we're also blessed to be used by God. Does God need the church? He doesn't even need us. But we're blessed to be part of His work. And so when we think about where we're at in history, Jesus has risen from the dead. He appeared to His followers. He went to heaven. He's in heaven today at the right hand of God the Father. The world is not falling apart. It's falling into place. And this is part of His plan, that we have this church age we're living in. And one of the reasons America is such a blessed place to live is because of the church. It's been a huge part of it. That's what has made, it, made America such a blessed... And that's why the church being revived is the key to America's future. It's the key to that. And He wants to use us in this church age. And we just need to remember where Jesus is at. Let's just look at Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 11 again so we can hear it. The disciples had come together. They asked Jesus, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? And so they wanted Jesus to be the political ruler in Israel. And the Scripture prophesies that someday when Jesus returns, the capital of the world will be Jerusalem. And in Hebrew, did you know that the name Jerusalem means the place where peace is provided? The Prince of Peace will rule and reign from there. And so these disciples are saying, Jesus, is it time for that? And then He says to them, it is not for you to know times or epochs, seasons, many years. So that's Jesus' clue to them. It's going to be a while. <laughs> Which the Father has fixed by His own authority. And then He says in verse 8, but you will receive what? Power. We receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my what? Witnesses. We are the witnesses of what Jesus has done. How many of you have something to share about what Jesus has done for you? He was telling those disciples in Israel that they would do this. In Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. I have a pastor friend, Brother Tommy and I have a pastor friend in Israel named Guy Cohen. And he was an Orthodox Jew who came to know Jesus. And then God called him to begin planting a church about 20 years ago called Harvest of Asher. And he's in the area of the tribe of Asher trying to reach people for Jesus there. But one day I got chills uh, when I had him as a guest at our Illinois Baptist State Association chapel and he says, isn't it incredible? He read this verse that the gospel has gone from I.L. Israel to I.L. Illinois. And it started here. And that's well, the reason I got chills was I thought, Lord, we really are close. We have to be close. The gospel has gone around the world. And yet out of God's grace, he's still giving people opportunities to come to Christ. He's not done. The reason that Jesus hasn't returned is His love for souls. He's giving people time. He has incredible patience. And He's using us. And He's waiting for us to get off of our fannies and go share with people. He wants us to do that. And we are blessed to be His witnesses all over the world. And we can go from Greenville, Tennessee and witness all over the world today. Verse 9, after Jesus said these things, He was lifted up while they were looking on and a cloud received Him out of their sight. How would you have liked to have seen that? And I love verse 10. They're just standing there with their mouths wide open. Maybe looking at each other. Did you see that? As they were gazing intently into the sky while He was going, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. They said, men of Galilee, why do you stand there looking into the sky? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in just the same way as you have watched Him go into heaven. So as Jesus writes this letter to the church in Ephesus, all this has happened. And we're living in the time between Jesus' first coming and His returning to heaven and His second coming. When He's going to come and set up His kingdom. And how long is Jesus' kingdom going to last when He comes back? Amen. He's, it's, he'll have a thousand year millennial kingdom, but He's going to reign forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Now this early church, it grew quickly. As it began to grow, thousands were saved and they were growing in Christ. People were receiving Jesus as the gospel spread. It doesn't mean it was easy. There was a sweet fellowship. But the early church experienced a lot of persecution. They didn't get to have elections. They just found out that someone killed the current emperor and became the new emperor. And that many times they would live under persecution. But yet the gospel continued to spread. 
We see in Acts chapter 2, when Peter preaches the first sermon of the church age at Pentecost, it says, when they heard Peter preach the gospel, they were pierced to the heart. I love that. And then to Peter and the apostles, they said, brethren, what shall we do? That's why, Brother Tommy, it's so important to give an invitation. This is the first invitation of the church age that you're about to see. So in other words, we are to, when we share God's Word, and this, this applies to whether you're a teacher or a preacher, anytime you share God's Word, Miss Lingo in my third grade Sunday school class modeled this. She would teach the Word, and then she gave an invitation for us because she knew we were in that third, fourth grade spectrum where that's when we we're starting to learn and understand our need for Christ. And so we were wondering, what should we do? When my grandma had cancer and I realized she had real faith and I knew about Jesus, but I didn't know Jesus, I was asking, what should I do? Look at what Peter says. It says, Peter said to them, repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sin and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to Himself. That's a beautiful statement, isn't it? And then I like verse 40 because it doesn't tell us what he said, Brother Tommy. He just was begging people to come to Jesus. It says, with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. So God's people on earth during the church age, we are agents of God's love. We are agents of God's wonderful information of His Word, but we're also agents of God's invitation, inviting people to come to Jesus. And the Holy Spirit helps us to do that. And if you've not invited someone to come to Jesus, you've not finished your job. And I've not finished my job. And that means in individual conversations. When revival comes, we're doing that every day. As we go, as we get the opportunity. How many of that makes you nervous when you hear that? As Danny Egemeyer, one of the deacons at my church in southern Illinois, he had several hundred acres that he farmed. And I would say something like that. And he'd say, Brother Scott, you're plowing close to the corn. <laughs> because he was convicted. And I was, I mean, I'm convicted by this. I have neighbors that need Jesus. I need to, I have one man across the street from me who doesn't know Jesus yet and he's got abdominal cancer. We've got to lead him to Jesus. That's something we need to be doing. So you pray for me to be a good neighbor. That's what a good neighbor does. Amen. We should love people. We should share the good news, but we should also be agents of invitation. Now, God's the one that does the saving, but we get to be part of this in the church age. And that's what Peter does. And we see in verse 41, so then those who had received his word were baptized. And on that day, there were added how many souls? Would you all have liked to help with all those baptisms? Wow, that had to be incredible to see that and, um, and to be a part of that. And that's what we're called to do. That's a church that's alive and in love with Jesus. But because we struggle with our sinful nature, problems can crop up in our lives and our churches when we take our eyes off of Jesus. Satan wants to get our eyes off of Jesus. Just like Peter, when he started to sink down in that water, many of our churches have their eyes off of Jesus and they're starting to sink. That's a picture. You know, Peter's individual experience is a picture of what can happen to us corporately when we get our eyes off of Jesus. In Romans 8, verses 5 through 8, Paul says this, those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. When we know Jesus, we need to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. Peter warns us in 1 Peter 5 verse 8, Be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. And when a Christian tells me they think it's fine to use mind-altering drugs to relax, I just pull out this verse. Be of what? Why in the world, if you're a, do you think it's smart for a soldier on the front lines to be drunk? 
whatever, I'm not, I'm not naming the substance because there's lots of substances. But, but we, need to be, we need to be getting our fulfillment from Jesus. And we need to realize we are in an intense spiritual battle before the return of Christ. And we need to get our fulfillment from Him. And when we're fulfilled by Him and we're filled with His Word, we're able to have a sober spirit. And we're able to be alert. And Satan, one of the reasons he's having such a heyday is we are letting our guard down in so many ways and allowing him to creep into our minds. What are you watching on your TV? What are you watching on your phone? Get that clean. Get someone to help you. Accountability is a wonderful, freeing thing. We need to be of sober spirit. And this church at Ephesus was doing a lot for God they believed and taught the Bible and they did many things to reach people. So again, they, they might have had an incredible ministry to widows. They probably had a, a, you know, I don't know, they had children's ministry. They probably had youth ministry. They had many different ministries. And Jesus says they taught His Word. They taught the Word of God. Look at what it says in verses 1-3. through three. Jesus says, To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands, says this, I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance and that you cannot tolerate evil men and you put to the test those who call themselves apostles and they are not and you found them to be false and you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake and have not grown weary. So there's some commendation there. And I think Jesus would say a lot of those things to Towering Oaks today. Because you are being faithful. You, ha you have reached out in many different ways. But the problem with the church of Ephesus was they had fallen out of love with Jesus. Jesus saw that their hearts were drifting away from Him. They were doing the things, um, but as one, as one wise deacon said when I was preaching on revival there, he says, I think we're serving Jesus at this church out of muscle memory. And we're just doing this because it's what we've always done. It's not because our heart is burning with passion for Jesus and to reach one more soul. But that's healthy to realize that. And then what we do is just like Peter, we say, Jesus, save us. Save us from ourselves. We're drifting. Help us come back. The problem at Ephesus was they had left their first love. And we can do that. In Matthew 22, Remember, Jesus was asked, what is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said, quoting the Old Testament, quoting God, God's admonition to Israel, He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. So our service to Jesus should always flow out of that love relationship. How is your love relationship with Jesus? Towering Oaks. How is your love relationship with Jesus? Um, God cares about the heart. The outward actions, if the heart is not with Jesus, He, he knows that. John 15, 5, we saw it last night. Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If you cut that branch off of a tree and then you glue it back on somehow, how's it going to do in a couple of weeks? It may look okay for a few, you know, for a little bit, but gradually it's going to die, isn't it? Even though it may still look attached, it's not. Peter says in chapter 5 of 1 Peter, verses 6 and 7, he says, Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that He may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety on Him. How many of you have anxiety? We do. We have, I've prayed with you even this weekend for loved ones you have, situations you have, things that are going on. We need to cast our anxiety on Him because He cares for us. And we should never forget that God is more interested in who we are than what we do. He is more interested in who we are than what we do. So if my heart's right with the Lord, and it doesn't mean that I'm anywhere, anywhere close to perfect. Goodness, no, none of us are. But if we just love Jesus and, have, and, and let Him live His life through us, that's when we're able to see the miracles happen. That he's able to, and what I mean by miracles, he uses us in ways we can't imagine. 
you know? I still remember standing in Uptown Baptist Church and thinking about my memo and Papa Wilds, wondering what they would think about their grandson preaching in downtown Chicago. And it was the day before the world closed for the pandemic. And we finished the service with Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him, there is no other. But we didn't, they didn't know when they would get to see each other again. Because um, Chicago was a little bit of a tough place during the, the pandemic. But when we just are, if we just follow Jesus, he'll take us places. That's a place I never expected to be. <laughs> and I'm sure there's places you've never expected to be. And God will take you there. And if you'll just ask God to give you his heart, he's the one that lives the life through us. He lives his life through us. That's when the miracles happen. And look at what Samuel says in 1 Samuel 15. Samuel said, Has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as obeying the voice of the Lord? You know, and so, you know, when Samuel heard, when Samuel heard Jesus' admonition to the church at Ephesus for the first time, maybe in heaven when they've studied God's word, you know, he had to love that passage too. As obeying the voice of the Lord, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. And to heed, in other words, to follow Jesus is better than the fat of rams. The best offering you could ever give. The biggest check you could ever write. God wants our heart. He wants our heart. And then in Proverbs, God warns us and calls us and lovingly just admonishes us. He says, watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. Uh, yesterday, Mom and I went back into Tweed Springs. Is that the name of it, Mom? Which is down near St. James and Cedar Creek. That's where my grandmother grew up. And uh, there is there are some incredible springs coming out of that mountain that we were looking at and the water coming out. And I mean, we could go drink that water. It's fresh. And my grandmother had it in Houston Valley, a spring fed. That We called it Houston Valley water. It's the best tasting water I ever had. But there would be about once a month, Mama would go and, and she would clean out that spring. She would take her garden hoe and keep that spring cleaned out so the water would be clean coming in the house. And there was one time she even said, Scotty, our hearts get clouded up like this sometimes and we need to turn to Jesus and let Him clean out our spring. And that's what we're talking about when we see revival. We need to watch over our heart. And we see David here saying, Created me a clean heart. Notice how he says that. He, he doesn't say, reform my behavior. He says, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. God gives us His heart. So in other words, J. Vernon McGee says it like this. I don't know if any of y'all like to listen to him. I still i am on his Bible bus and listen. But he says we need Jesus to give us a heart transplant every day. And that's a good way to say this. Let Jesus put His heart in us. That's revival. Matthew 5, 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. They shall see God. And when we love Jesus, we stay pure, we stay humble, we stay devoted to His Word. And when we're devoted to Jesus and we have His heart, we just cannot help but reach people. You just can't help, but, can't help it. And did you know God will actually send people to you when He knows your heart's right? Because He knows you're going to love on them and take care of them and lead them to Jesus. And so if our heart's right, we're going to be focused on reaching people with His love. That's what happened in the early church in Acts 2, 42-47. It says, because their hearts were devoted to Jesus, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread. They were Baptists. They liked those donuts and other things, right? And to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together, and they had everything in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. And then day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple. Now, when we think about the temple, the, when I was first reading this, before Brother Tommy taught me about it more at growing up, I thought this meant they were going to church. And when they went to the temple, it was actually more like going to Walmart. 
Because the temple was the place they were worshiping the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but they weren't talking about Jesus in those services. But what these new believers were doing was, how many of y'all remember Paul Harvey and his uh, show? What was his show called? He had this show called The Rest of the Story. And these Jerusalem believers were going to the temple to tell people the rest of the story and leading them to Christ. And then they were going from house to house. I think one of the issues in the American church is we've closed up our homes. People will talk to you about things at their dinner table. They won't talk to you in the Sunday school class. Did you know that? And when they're all facing the same direction toward a pulpit, I love corporate worship, but that's not enough. You need to get people in your home. And when we get people in our homes, incredible things can happen. Our home many times is the most expensive possession we own. And it can be the most powerful mission tool we have. And I think when revival comes in the American church, we're going to be using our homes a lot more because we just want to let our neighbors in. We want them to experience what we have. And I'm going to say this. This might plow close to the corn. Is it one of the reasons we don't like people in our houses is we don't want them to see what we're watching we don't want them to see the idols in our homes potentially. Let's think about that and let the Lord speak to us and deal with us as we think about, okay, if they come into our homes and I'm a witness, I'm going to have to make sure I'm a good example, right? They took their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. This church in love with Jesus in Jerusalem, even the unsaved people knew there was something different about them. Does Greenville know there's just something different about those people at Towering Oaks? Because we're so loving? Because we're reaching out to them? Do we have a good name in the community? That's important, isn't it? This, these believers in Jerusalem had a reputation of being loving and caring. I, at uh, one time when I was pastoring in Stillville, we had a, a program called Upward Soccer. We had about 100 children and their families that came. And uh, this is in southern Illinois. And one of the soccer moms came into my office one day and she had two boys that played soccer. And she says, I need to talk to you. And um, so we sat down there. And of course, I thank goodness my secretary and had some other folks there with me nearby. But she was just saying, why do you why, why do you all hate gay people and hate people who've had abortions? <laughs> and so I just I said, well, first of all, we don't hate anyone. Jesus loves everyone but we just believe the Bible. And I walked her through it and she started to cry. And she said, well, I'm, the reason I asked you those two questions is there's been a lot of people in town telling me that about you. But she said, all I'm seeing is that your church loves me and my family. And I don't understand how they can say that. And yet you're so loving. And what I realized my church was doing, I was proud of them. They were loving people so much. It was, it was uh, dispelling the lies of the devil <laughs> that were keeping people away. He was trying to keep people away. And God's love cuts through that. And she, in her heart, said, she says, I know that book's true. And she even said to me, she said, sometimes I just don't want to admit that it's true. We know it's true, don't we? And we, need to not, we don't need to compromise our truth, but when we're loving and we have favor with the people, not everybody's going to receive Jesus. I wish they did. But when we're faithfully loving and we're faithfully sharing the gospel and we're faithfully inviting people to Jesus because of our love relationship with Him, every day there are going to be people that are coming to Christ. Not just on Sunday during a service, but every day. Through the Towering Oaks Christian School. Amen? Through all the different ministries that God leads us to have as we go. And Jesus is waiting to run to us and revive us when we return to Him as our first love and when we turn away from our sin. So, just like in Ephesus, and we, we don't have time to look at all seven letters, <laughs> but just like in Ephesus, if we will return to Jesus as our first love, He is waiting to run to us. In Acts 3.19, God says, Therefore repent and return so your sins may be wiped away in order that what? Times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. That's a picture of salvation. It's also a picture for us when we return to Jesus. He sends a time of refreshing. And revival comes when God takes us and cleanses us. As my memo said, clean out that spring that's in our hearts. Right, Aaron? <laughs> 
clean out that spring and let God help us fall in love with Him again. Look at what Jesus says. He warns them. He says, I'm going to remove the lampstand out of its place unless you repent. Verse 6, Yet this you do have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. There were false There was false Christianity was already starting to creep in early on. Do we have false Christianity today? We certainly do. We have legalistic Christianity, which is talking about earning your salvation and or keeping your salvation by works. There's no way we have hope either way. (laughs) The only hope is in Jesus by grace through faith. There's also liberal Christianity. And that's when people, their minds are so open, their brains have fallen out. And they, they want to take this. You, you're not supposed to look at this book like a buffet, right? And pick the verses that you think are true and ignore the verses that you think are aren't that you think aren't. And by the way, when we get to heaven, you're never going to hear Jesus say, what I meant to say was, <laughs> we need to stand by this book with love, okay? And then there's also prosperity Christianity, which I also call name it and claim it, blab it and grab it preaching. And if you write a certain check to that person so they can have their yacht, all your problems will be filled. Beware of those. And do you know why those guys do so well? It's because so many people don't read this. And God has given them over to that. Don't be one of those people. Let's be a church. I think I am so blessed that God guided our family to a church that has fed us a steady diet of God's Word. And um, when we stay rooted in that, we're able to be faithful. And so again, God loved this church in Ephesus. He was calling them back to Him. And Jesus says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Who, how do we overcome? We just follow Jesus. So that's a promise to followers of Jesus. Our, I'm sure that's going to be wonderful fruit that we get to eat at that tree of life. Remember 2 Chronicles 7, 14. When my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Now the part that I want us to see, this is, this is a huge conviction that I have right now as I travel Illinois. We have, the heart change can happen very quickly. The forgiveness can happen very quickly. I believe, and God will bring healing relatively quickly, but I believe this is the mission, the the current mission of our church. First of all is we need to get revived. So if you're not revived, ask God to revive you. And I'm asking God to revive me. But if I'm revived, there's going to be some years invested in this. Not just one day, not just one hour. Maybe Wouldn't it be great if the rest of our lives is devoted to just healing America through the gospel? I mean, that's there, is there any better way to live? <laughs> and that's the picture. This is, a, this is an, a continual action that the revived church gets to live until God takes us to be with Him. So when God brings revival, His glory is displayed. People are drawn to Him. And people are hungry. Just remember the story about the Asbury event? And did you know that that young preacher got up there and preached and he texted, I think he texted his wife and said, I just preached a horrible sermon. And then we see people seeking God, confession of sin. But the the big thing that that I got out of that event was that so many people wanted to go there because they're hungry to see God work and hungry to see God move. And that just tells you there's hunger. But we don't have to drive to a place to experience revival. He wants to bring it here in you and in me. He wants your home to be a little corner of heaven on earth because you are so in love with Jesus. James 4, verse 8, Draw near to God and He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hands, you double, or purify your hearts, you double-minded. Let's take some time around the table. And you've got some questions here, and I'm just going to give you about 15 minutes, and then we'll take a short bathroom break. Around the tables, you've got several questions, and I'll just let you look through them. And, And maybe what you need to do with these questions in your workbook is answer these at home afterward. And maybe you want to refer to the videos that we have later too. But ask each other this. How are you doing in your love for Jesus? Do you feel like you're moving toward Jesus or drifting away? How have you been doing in spending quality time with Jesus? What are the barriers to that? And pray 
for each other that you will make time for Him. Let's pray. Lord, be with us now as we share around the tables. Work in our hearts and forgive us for where we leave you as our first love and help us to return to you. And thank you that we can cry out to you, save us, and you do. (laughs) We love you, Father. Just be with us now in this time. Help us to be open and honest and encourage one another. In Jesus' name, amen. Start sharing around those tables.